so I'm happy to just take things as they go um, and get to whatever you guys think of. So the, yeah, so the presentation will be structured as follows. Uh, quick about me, why I like pedal so much, uh, starting a company, um, sort of the growth of uh, electronic audio experiments from uh, one-man basement shop to more professional one-man basement shop. Um, and then uh, you know, the whole idea of designing pedals. So uh, quick about me, um, I got my bachelor's in physics in 2014 from BU, right down the street. Um, I am currently working on a PhD in quantum optics. Um, technically, it's under the double E umbrella, but that's only because a lot of the manufacturing processes for optical devices are the same as making computer chips, long story short. Um, I've done my time in a couple of bands of extremely minor notoriety, um, and during that time, I got really interested in the technical side of uh, audio equipment, um, and from there, moved into pedals. Um, and so that was how I got my start making a, you know, as a pedal company. Um, you know, I just think that the, the pedal world is easily the most sort of artistic world in audio. Um, I say that because there's a million different ways to, uh, I regret my choice of phrasing already, skin the cat. Um, the, uh, you know, if you, if you want something that is exactly the way you want it, um, it's out there. And if it's not out there, uh, the bar for entry is low. Um, and that is a good thing because if, you, if there's something you feel like you're missing, you can sit down and figure out how to make it yourself. Um, and there's an endless degree of form factors, art styles, you know, I can go on, on the internet and order a hundred different knobs. Like, it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, and every single one of these pedals has its own personality, its own players that like it, uh, its own players that hate it, its own players that'll pay $3,000 for the exact right one. It's just, it's a crazy world. Um, and I like being a part of it, not just as a player, but also as someone who makes them and tries to capture lightning in a bottle, as it were. So uh, the beginnings were very humble. Um, a folding table in the back hallway next to the bathroom of my old apartment. Um, I made things look like this. Uh, I think this was a Boss HM2 clone. Um, I've contacted the guy who I sold it to to be like, please send this back to me so that I can make something that is not terrible. But uh, I started somewhere. Um, I'm sure that uh, it's either in the trash somewhere or someone is happy with it. Really no idea. The pedals are weird like that. Um, but very quickly I started coming up with designs, um, you know, not just, uh, you know, cloning stuff for friends at cost or for beer money, um, but trying to come up with something that was at least different to me and unique to me and something that would address my own needs as a player. Um, and that first pedal was uh, something called the Longsword. Um, it had a bunch of variations under the same umbrella, but uh, yes, that is paint marker. The board barely fit in the enclosure. It's kind of a mess. It was my, one of my first Eagle layouts that was not totally terrible. Um, but I sold 20 of them in a couple months over the summer in uh, 2015, and uh, I was hooked. It was really fun uh, to be able to sort of turn around a product, even though it had very, a very humble uh, origin. So as, uh, as time went on, I figured out how to get better at Eagle layouts. I got better at electrical design. I realized the first version had a bunch of weird quirks that I didn't fully understand, and so I sought to understand them and uh, either capitalize on them or eliminate them altogether. Um, like there was one switch where it wasn't supposed to do this, but if you, if you flipped it, it screwed up the op amp bias and then everything got really weird for like five minutes and then it would settle back where it was supposed to go. Um, all sorts of fun stuff like that that came from me just breadboarding, putting things together without fully understanding them. But there's a magic to it. And even the later versions, I try to keep some of the weird quirks that showed up early on because uh, a pedal doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be inspiring. So the, uh, another design that came out um, around the same time, it didn't uh, really show up until uh, early 2016, was the Model FBT. Um, this was inspired by the Sun Model T, um, which is uh, a really classic tube amp. Um, it's loud, it's got a really nice preamp that's kind of descended from old Marshall and Fender designs, but it really has a voice of its own. Um, it's loud and, and a guitar player would call it hi-fi, but really what that means is that it's got a very nice bass response and a very nice presence in a band mix. Um, but it's just a magical amp, and I wanted to capture its essence in the pedal circuit, so that's what we tried to do with this one. Um, so that was the second design that got added to the roster. Um, this was around when we started getting more professional screen printing and stuff, and not just uh, hand painting with a marker. Yes? And does the circuit have a vacuum tube in it? It does not. It uses uh, all uh, JFET uh, transistors and actually some VJTs as well. Um, but the uh, JFETs have a nice, uh, you know, three halves power law response, which at low voltages is uh, a lot better than having uh, vacuum tubes on the floor. 
So the first big leap we made after that um, was uh, getting not just everything screen printed, but also professionally CNC'd. Um, I, sh I was able to shrink down the Model FUT into a more uh, concise enclosure, get it in line with everything else, so there's more of like a consistent uh, aesthetic and, and font choices and everything else. Um, by this point, we were really focusing on production batches. I had done a lot of one-offs before, but that uh, was shifting over because instead of building 15 different things, I had to build 15 of the same thing, and then 20 of the same thing, and then 30, and then 50. Um, so as it grew, we, we refined our operation. I brought some other people in, you know, just guys would come over on weekends to help me stuff circuit boards um, or help lay things out or be packing and shipping. Um, and so it grew uh, naturally from there. Um, so yeah, here are some of the one-offs that I've made. Like, uh, these are all 2016. Um, there's a headphone amp that I designed that's good for guitar. It's got a, uh, a JFET preamplifier and a speaker simulator um, so that when you go to trade shows, you can plug in headphones. Yes? Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, uh, so when you say uh, circuit boards, you, are you referring specifically to edge circuit boards or are they still breadboards? Um, we are printing the circuit. We were getting uh, printed circuit boards at this time, um, but then we're populating them in-house. Um, so it's all, at, the, at, at this time, everything's through hole hand soldered, um, we'll just get a panel and then uh, stuff them all, hand solder them up, break the panel apart, um, and then box everything up with the hardware. Um, so that was sort of how the manufacturing cycle has gone and continues to go. Um, and these designs are older, so there's a lot more hardware that's off board, but as things got more streamlined, we can put more hardware on the board. Um, you can see in uh, this photo on the right, there's, I, I, if you want, I can crack some of these pedals open later on. Um, but the pots are mounted to the circuit board and the toggles so that everything is more compact and much faster to assemble, um, reducing those number of solder joints by half. So yeah, these are just some of the one-offs. Um, I've done a couple of tube amps um, just as a nice side venture. We did think about putting those into production commercially, um, but there are a dozen reasons why that's not a good idea, and I can get into that later if you're interested in hearing it. Um, so after uh, 2017, we ended up with a lot more designs. I really went on a big R&D push uh, in the summer, uh, this past summer, because they're just, I have more ideas than time. Um, and we focused on some new things like the analog delay prototype, which I'm gonna talk about in a lot of depth today, um, uh, an analog reverb, uh, this interesting auto swell generator effect, um, the, uh, the Dude Incredible, which is based on uh, Steve Albini's guitar rig, um, and that one, has, that one was a big hit. Um, some new stuff like that, the dagger, which is a miniaturized long sword. Um, but the, the, basically what happened was it just, uh, our variety has exploded. We're trying to come up with new ideas. Um, and that's where things are today, is trying to sort of strike the balance between coming up with new stuff and then making the stuff that uh, already is out there and people like. So that was enough about me. Um, I feel like this presentation is more about um, you know, what it is to come up with a new idea, um, but also, um, even before that, where do you start with making pedals? Um, I think the best way to get started is to use kits. Um, there are a lot of really amazing kits out there and for uh, $50 to $70, you can get just a self-contained, it's pre-drilled, it's got the box, the circuit board, all the components, and even some wire. Um, and then a few tools and you put that together and you have something that just works right off the bat. Um, kits are nice because they're tip, the good ones are like the ones that listed here. Uh, build Your Own Clone is my personal favorite, but Fuzz Dog and uh, General Guitar Gadgets, or uh, GGG, as they're known, um, are really mainstays in the DIY world, and it's so nice to just get everything in one, uh, sort of one place, especially uh, Fuzz Dog has an enormous variety. If you can think of an effect, especially a fuzz boost uh, distortion, they have it uh, on their website. And uh, it's just nice to, you know, sort of have that immediate tangible result. You get good at soldering. You can look at the schematic and figure out what makes them tick. Um, and before you know it, you'll have, you can have a pedal collection which costs way less than buying something from an actual company uh, would cost. And then once you've done that, like once you've built a few things, you, you'll start to see patterns. You'll start to say, oh, well, I built a Distortion Plus and then I built a Proco Rat and I built this thing. And, you know, why, does, why do they all have an op amp with clipping diets to ground, for example? Um, and you can start to see the patterns and kind of just see how the sausage is made. And if you back that up just by reading a chapter of an electronics textbook here and there, your knowledge will really start to increase. Um, a lot of pedal designs are fairly basic electronically. The devil's in the details. The devil's in, you know, uh, do I filter this frequency or that frequency? Um, what is the difference between a distortion and a fuzz? Turns out it's just where you cut the low end in the circuit. Um, and all sorts of stuff like that is just fantastic. And you don't have to do a deep dive into uh, you know, feedback theory and differential equations and deriving filter transfer functions and all that to have an appreciation for what makes a good pedal good. 
Um, and the other cool thing is I'm, I'm trying to set this up is, uh, you know, just pedal building class where you can just go and, uh, you know, sit down and learn how to solder in person. YouTube is great for that stuff. Um, I learned how to solder from YouTube and uh, I don't suck at soldering. Um, so there are definitely ways to do it, but I think in person is really the best way to do that sort of thing. Um, so that's the getting started angle. But now let's say that you've done a few pedals, you can read a schematic and you want to make something that's new. Um, it's very easy to take a tube screamer and put a different switch on it and put it in a pretty enclosure and you'll sell 50 of them like in a month. People just love that stuff. But is it intellectually satisfying? Not necessarily. Um, you know, like, is it really going to scratch the creative itch that would make you want to write a song or start a band or write an album or something? Um, and I think the creative process fundamentally for making a new pedal is trying to find something that's missing. If your rig is like, well, this sounds really great, but uh, you know, when I turn on all my pedals, I don't cut through the mix. Or you know, my bass player just sounds really bad, and they've tried everything, and, and it's not quite working. I know it's not their bass or their amp. Um, you find, you know, there's going to be something missing. Everyone has it. Everyone has their own very specific, very granular needs as a musician. And if you can tap into that, you've got a concept. You can say, oh, well, I really like this particular type of overdrive, but it doesn't sound good when I play it with a Fender. Why doesn't it sound good? Um, and that was actually a big reason why I came up with the long sword was because I had a specific rig, but if I plugged in these pedals into a different amp, it didn't sound good. And I didn't want to just run an EQ pedal. I wanted it to be a contained unit. So uh, when it comes to the development side, you don't have to be an expert. Um, like I was saying before, every time you build something, you'll see it will typically use and abuse one or two circuit building blocks. If you learn those, you'll be good to go. If you can watch a YouTube video on a non-inverting op-amp circuit, for example, um, you'll be able to understand like dozens of different distortion pedal designs because they all use that same game block, just with different filtering, um, maybe a different parts choice here and there. But the subtleties will come later on. Once you get the basics, a lot of it is just sitting there with a breadboard or something, maybe swapping parts out and saying, oh, well, I really like, uh, you know, with this low pass filter here or with this low pass filter here or these diodes or whatever. And if you guys want to talk about specific components, I'm happy to do so later on. That's sort of tangential to the presentation. Um, so once that's all there, you sort of have your idea, you learn things as you go, uh, you can prototype. And this is an iterative process. So many times I'll have an idea, I'll prototype the idea, I'll be like, this sucks, I'm gonna change it a bunch, do a new prototype. Or you can just hack away the existing prototype until you get what you want. Prototyping is a sloppy process. Um, you might end up with something that's got a bunch of parts just soldered randomly all over the place. Uh, there's a form of prototyping that people like to call dead bug prototyping, where you can just sort of, uh, you know, wire everything point to point off a circuit board and it's just a little castle of nasty solder joints. But if it works and it sounds good, then you can just write that down. The only difference between, uh, you know, what is it, science and goofing off is if you write it down. Um, and then if you start getting feedback on stuff, then all you have to do is come up with a design uh, that you can make again. And if you write it down, you've got a schematic and a layout, you can do that. It's all there. So that's, that's sort of the whole process in a nutshell, is just you know, not, basically not being afraid to try something immediately, and also not being afraid to do something without fully understanding it. Um, if it doesn't give you what you want, you'll have to dig, dig deeper into the literature, into the data sheets, uh, you know, into your oscilloscope, until you get what you want, but you don't have to be an expert to do this. It's an art process. If, it, if the process serves your needs, then you just keep on going. So for the case study, um, I'm going to be talking about my analog delay design. Um, this pedal is called Sending. It's named after a D&D &D spell. I like D&D. &D. Um, and this is serving a need which I have sort of felt uh, through much of my own guitar playing career, which is that I like delays that have a little bit of overdrive in them. Um, there are a couple pedals which do this already. Uh, one of my favorites is the uh, Caroline Kilobyte, uh, which basically abuses a digital delay chip called the PT2399, which if you start DIYing your own pedals, you'll see them all over the place. It's an amazing chip. And if you overdrive it, it gives you a little bit of that 64K modem sound that's just really fun. Um, and so you kind of have that covered on the, the digital delay side. Um, there's a classic pedal called the Civ Echo Drive, which has a tube stage in it and you can overdrive it and it sounds cool. Uh, but there's a tube on the floor and if you're stepping on it, that's a risk. Um, there is you know, the Deluxe Memory Man, which is a classic analog delay. If you turn up the input gain on it, it'll crunch up, but not in a very satisfying way. Um, maybe if you're running it into a dirty amp, it sounds good, but on its own, it's kind of crappy. So with all those things there, I was like, I know there's gotta be some way 
to make an analog delay that could distort a little bit and still sound good. Um, and so down the rabbit hole I went. Um, see, that's my last slide. So I'm probably just going to write on the board a little bit and I can show you the delay itself and we can dive into some of the other pedals.